Uh, the title of this morning's sermon is, I Am the Man. I Am the Man. On the day of Jesus' resurrection, uh, two of his disciples were walking on a road, and they were talking about everything that happened, how the tomb of Jesus was found to be empty, how angels said that Jesus rose from the dead. But above all, as they were walking on that road and talking about everything that had happened, they talked about how it all seemed like an idle tale. As the two disciples went on this road, Jesus actually came to them. Jesus drew near to them and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus asked them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? After he said this, the two disciples stopped and stood still on the road. And they were very sad. They told Jesus about all the things that happened in the last few days, about how Jesus was mighty in deed and in word, how Jesus was condemned to death and crucified by the chief priests and rulers. They told Jesus about how three days later, his tomb was empty, and that angels said that Jesus was alive. And they said that they went to the tomb, but they did not see him. Jesus listened to all of this, and then he said these amazing words. O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things? and enter into his glory. And so on that day, that resurrection Sunday, the two disciples walked and talked with Jesus on that road. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures concerning the things about himself Jesus interpreted and spoke and taught them all the things about his suffering and his suffering unto glory. Now, I open with this very important story at the end of Luke because it helps us and it orients us as we think about the book of Lamentations and especially this very, very fascinating text. Highland, the book of Lamentations, you know this already, it's ultimately about Jesus. And here in chapter 3, the narrator, who very fascinatingly says, I am the man, the narrator who says this, he is ultimately quoting, I dare say, he is quoting Jesus. Not literally, not actually, but he is foreshadowing, he's previewing poetically who Jesus is and what he would do for his people. The narrator who says, I am the man, is quoting Jesus who is the son of man, who would come and suffer and die for our sins. And so this poetry, it serves ultimately to clarify and magnify all the suffering that Jesus endured for us. And that's what we're going to unpack this morning. And as we do that, I, I just simply hope, I really hope that this, this text and our time this morning will help you to grow in thanksgiving and love for Jesus. In the same way that, for example, when a son or a daughter thinks about their mom, their dad, and all that their parents went through for them, for their sake, 
it causes them to grow in love and thankfulness for their parents, you know? I hope that a same kind of thing happens this morning. And as you wait for the return of Jesus, I ask that you may never, ever forget about his suffering. I mean, we sing about it a lot every Sunday. You hear us talk about it a lot every Sunday. That's not a coincidence. And when you read your Bibles, it's hard to avoid the news that Jesus suffered for you. He suffered for your salvation. And he suffered for you and for your salvation because he loves you. He loves you. So again, I hope that you will always remember what Jesus went through for your sake. And I hope that Lamentations 3 will help you to grow in thanksgiving and love for Jesus. Here we go. Um, I'll speak from the text. You'll, you can follow me pretty easily, though I might jump uh, here and there, uh, around here and there in the text. But dear Highland, let me begin by saying this. Remember, remember that Jesus is the man. He is the man who has seen affliction under the rod of wrath. He endured real physical pain on the cross as his hands and his feet were pierced with those large nails. He received the real holy wrath of the Father as judgment and punishment for sin. And in the words of Lamentations 3, he was besieged and enveloped with all bitterness and tribulation. And the divine bow was set against him. The arrow of justice was targeted upon him. Jesus took this affliction and this wrath for your sake. For you. Dear Highland, may you also remember that Jesus, he is the man. He is the man who was driven and brought into darkness without any light. When Jesus hung on the cross, there was actually darkness in the whole land from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, which is crazy because that's actually 12 o'clock noon to 3 p.m. Darkness throughout the whole land, a darkness that symbolizes exile and death. This man, this Jesus, was made to dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. And his soul was bereft of peace. All happiness was forgotten on that day. Jesus took this sad and terrible darkness for your sake. Dear Highland, may you also remember that Jesus is the man whose father turned his hand against him. Before his final breath, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the words of Lamentations 3, Jesus was walled in. He could not escape. His chains were made heavy, chains that, are, that were our sins that he carried. And though the son called and cried out to the father, there was no help. 
Jesus' legal status was made into one whose paths were crooked. He was treated like a criminal. He died as a criminal. Jesus took this forsakenness. He took this alienation for your sake. Dear Highland, remember that Jesus is the man. He is the man whose flesh and skin were made to waste away. Jesus was beaten and flogged. He was scourged with cruel instruments that were designed to tear through skin and tissue. His flesh and his skin were torn up and bloodied as when a bear or a lion tears up and bloodies their prey. And Jesus, he was pierced in his side by a spear. This actually happened. And in the words of Lamentations 3, it was like arrows of a quiver driven into one's kidneys. This wasting away of flesh and skin, Jesus took it, and he took it for your sake. Dear Highland, remember that Jesus is the man who became the laughing stock of people and the object of their taunts. Many people spat at Jesus, and many struck him and mocked him and ridiculed him. Soldiers put a crown of thorns on his head, and they pretended like he was a king. And they actually blindfolded him, and then they beat him, and they asked, prophecy, who is it that struck you? Aren't you the king of the Jews? And so in humiliation, in the words of Lamentations 3, Jesus was brought so low, so low that his teeth was made to grind on the gravel. Jesus took this dishonor. He took this blasphemy for your sake. Highland, this is why, this is why we love Jesus. We love him because of his suffering for us. We love him because he took our sins, he made them his own, and because of that, he suffered and died for us. This is why we love Jesus. We love him because he took the judgment. He took the exile. He took the pain and the hell that we deserved. And we love him because of all of that. He endured the most grievous torments in his soul and the most painful sufferings in his body for us. In the words of Lamentations 3, we love him because he ultimately says to us, I am the man. I am the man who has seen affliction. This is why we love the king. But the love doesn't end with just that. Remember what Jesus said to the two disciples on the road on the day of his resurrection? He said this, Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? You see, Jesus didn't just suffer, and then that was it. Jesus suffered and then he entered into his glory. Suffering unto glory. 
we also love Jesus because of this. Suffering unto resurrection glory. You know, there are a lot of many good stories out there about cities, cities that were um, rebuilt and reborn after disaster and destruction. There is, for example, the city of Chicago, where the the great fire of 1871 just ruined pretty much everything. Um, in our lifetimes, I, I'm sure you can re recall New York City uh, and when it was devastated by the terrorist attacks of 9-11. And the list goes on and on. All of these cities in the world, stories of cities that were rebuilt reborn with a sense of lasting newness and through great suffering and lamentation the people of these cities what did they do they they revitalized they reinvented themselves with a sense of lasting restoration but let me tell you this morning that there's no story like the city of Jerusalem here in Lamentations. You know, many years after the fall and the exile of the city of Jerusalem, God actually brought his people back to, the, to their homeland. And we see this in books like Ezra and Nehemiah. And according to these books, Ezra and Nehemiah, there was a kind of rebuilding there was a kind of rebirth. There was a sense, a sense of newness and restoration. But at the end of the day, it wasn't new enough. And it wasn't the restoration that they ultimately needed. There was still sin. There was still suffering. There was still empty, emptiness and lamentation. But many years after that, after Ezra and Nehemiah, there finally came the man of Lamentations 3. And this man entered into the city of Jerusalem, a city that was still devastated by great sin, and by the attacks of the enemy. And this man walked in the very streets of the city that were once upon a time filled with infants and babies who fainted and cried to their mothers. And what did this man of Lamentations 3 do? He came into that city to suffer unto glory. He came to suffer and to die for his people, for his church, for the new Jerusalem, so that they too, and this is the catch, so that they too would die in having been united with him. Jesus came to suffer and die. And we who are united with him, we also die in him. His work, it was not just a rebirth or a rebuilding for his kingdom. His work was nothing less than new creation. His work was nothing less than a resurrection life for himself and for his people. And if we are united, if you are united with Christ, 
then you too have been made into a new creation. And every Resurrection Sunday, which is not Easter, it's every Sunday, every Resurrection Sunday is your Resurrection Day too. It's a celebration of the fact that you have been made into a new creation. And there's nothing more new than that. Chicago, New York City, the actual Jerusalem there in the Middle East right now, they could build the best buildings they want. But there is nothing quite like what you have. A suffering of Christ, a suffering unto glory, resurrection life glory. You have died in Christ, and you have been raised in Christ as well. In Christ, you have passed through judgment. And so if you remember the story where Israel was baptized into the Red Sea, they were going through that waters to escape the death and the destruction of Pharaoh's army. Just like that, you too have been baptized into Jesus and into his death. I say this because when we read Lamentations 3, it begins to dawn on us that that story of judgment, that story of exile, which is ultimately a story of how Christ received judgment and exile, that's our story too in the sense that there's no more judgment for us. It's happened. It's done. It's finished. It's over. And just as the Israel of old emerged from those waters, the enemy dead, and as they emerged from the waters as a new nation, you too have been born again as a new creation in Christ. Therefore, words like Romans 6, 4, and 5 are so awesome. We were buried, therefore, with Jesus by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too, we too, might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Brothers and sisters, I admit I'm not the best at putting forth the, the amazing drama here that is happening in this text. But there is amazing drama here. You have died in Christ. And you have been raised in Christ. If Jesus suffered unto glory, and now he is glorified, what does that mean for you? It means that there's no more judgment for you. And what's waiting for you is that same glory that Jesus now has. Resurrection, life, glory. And that brings us back to the story that we began with today. The story of Jesus and the two disciples walking and talking on that road. After Jesus interpreted to, the, to them all the things about himself, about his suffering unto glory, he joined them for an evening meal. And so when he was at table with them, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them. And at that moment, the eyes of those two disciples, they were opened. Remember, they couldn't see that it was Jesus, but now their eyes were opened and they recognized him. But then the moment that they recognized him, he just vanished from their sight. 
And then they said to each other these beautiful words. Did not our hearts burn within us while, we talked to, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? Did not our hearts burn when he told us about his suffering unto glory? After they said that, they rose, they went back to Jerusalem, they found all the other disciples, and they told them what happened. They told them that, that, that they were on the road, and they were walking, and then Jesus came to them. They didn't know it was him, and, and, and he told them about his suffering unto glory, and then they broke bread, and then they saw him. They understood. And here's the main point of the end of that story. They believed in the resurrection of Christ. And they understood, they began to understand that they were also resurrected as well. Brothers and sisters, this is the good news. This is what I love to share with you uh, each and every Sunday. And I hope that for the rest of our lives, we could, just like these two disciples, I hope that our hearts can burn as well. And that as we walk down the roads of this old and fading earth, walking as Jesus' disciples too, in a sense, walking as pilgrims, waiting for his return, my hope and prayer is simply this, that you may walk with Jesus with a greater thanksgiving and a love for him, perhaps a little more this morning. And that you would grow in the grace and the knowledge of his suffering unto glory. I hope that that phrase just gets etched into your heart. And I hope and pray that you would pray this for everyone here at Highland. That we would together grow in thanksgiving and love for Jesus. As we think more deeply, especially in our time in Lamentations. Think more deeply about wow, this is, this is what Jesus went through. This is how much he suffered for me. And so I invite you, especially those of you who maybe your hearts have grown cold. It's not burning anymore. It's, it's cold. It's, it's, it's out. The love of Christ is hard for you. There are many different ways that a pastor can answer, you know, why that's happening. But this morning, I offer you one answer. Perhaps you've forgotten the suffering of Christ, how real it was, how poetically terrible it was, as described in Lamentations. Perhaps you've forgotten the body and the blood that was broken and shed for your soul. Again, we grow a lot when we realize how much our parents suffered for us. How much more would we grow when we really think about Jesus' suffering unto glory? May we pray that this week. May we pray that for the rest of our lives. And may we continue to say that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Amen. Let's pray.